time for our, our featured guest speaker. And he is going to be introduced uh, because of his long association with our neuro ophthalmology uh, uh, division by our, our own Dr. Warner. Dr. Warner. Actually, it, it looks like Dr. Warner, but it's really Dr. Katz, but he can't speak right now because part of his face is paralyzed from dental procedures. So I will be, my lips are moving, but it's Dr. Katz's word. Um, this year's distinguished alumnus is Dr. Arefe Edeshina. Arefe comes from a medical family. His mom still works as a pediatrician and his father is a retired neuropathologist. His wife, Sean, recently attained a master's degree in nursing and will be rejoining the workforce now that the youngest of their three children has started kindergarten. Since completing our neuro ophthalmology fellowship in 2013, Dr. Ray Adeshina has practiced at UT Health Houston and the Rees Department of Ophthalmology and Vision Sciences at the McGovern Medical School. Dr. Adeshina currently serves as the medical director of that health system's Sizik Eye Clinic and holds a John P. McGovern professorship. He has been awarded the Dean's Teaching Excellence Award in recognition of outstanding contributions to education at this school and has been recognized by the residents as the outstanding faculty in surgical education. He even has his own neuro-ophthalmology podcast, Out of the Blind Spot, that you should check out. Dr. Adeshina is passionate about improving diversity, equity, and inclusion in our profession, your profession, and serves as a mentor in the AAO AUPO Minority Ophthalmology Mentoring Program. He also works with the NMA, the National Medical Association, the collective voice of African American physicians, to broaden the pool of qualified minority candidates by introducing these students to ophthalmology earlier in their medical education. Please give a warm Moran welcome to our own Dr. Arefe Adeshina. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm still pinching myself a little bit that I'm here giving this talk. Um, first of all, great job to all the residents. Testament to the great training education that you're getting here and the quality of people that you are. And reminds me of how wonderful my time was here. I'm very proud to be Moran alumnus. I wear it proudly on my chest as you guys should as well. And preach the gospel of the great work that's being done here. Uh, when you leave. Okay. I've been gone for over 10 years. It's my first time back in, in 10 years, and I'm still a little awestruck about being here and also being in the mountains again. It's fun to be back in the, the Mountain West. But I'm going to talk about a topic that I didn't really think I'd be doing at this point in my career. Sometimes you choose life and it chooses you, and you you make it work that way. And I hope to encourage, inspire, maybe challenge you to a degree uh, with the words I'm going to be speaking, uh, and also tell you a bit about what I've been up to you know, personally and, and professionally. So we'll go ahead and get started. How's it going here? I have no disclosures, and I need to disclaim that the views expressed in this talk are purely my own and do not represent my department or institution, okay? I'm from Texas and I'm in Utah, if you get my drift. <laughs> we'll talk about my background, how I became a neuro-ophthalmologist, my DEI journey, how that started, where it is, and then my podcast journey at the end, as Dr. Warner alluded to. So how did I become a neuro-ophthalmologist that's my name, that's my full name. That's the name on my name badge at work. And when patients see my name, first thing they ask is how do you pronounce it? You gotta go through that. Then the next thing they say is, that's not an American name. Where's that from? And in my mind, I'm saying, well, my name is just as American as John Smith, but that's another discussion. And when I tell them where I spent my formative years, they're like, oh, that's cool, but where are you really from? And then I double down on that and usually move on. But for you guys, I'll tell you where I'm really from. 
This is Nigeria. I'm Nigerian by birth. I was born in Elisha, Nigeria, February 16th, 1982. And I am the son of physicians. My father is a retired MD, PhD neuropathologist. My mom's a pediatrician. And that is me at age four on the right and me at age one on the left, a week after my first birthday, because my sister was born on my first birthday, delaying my birthday party. So that's my first birthday party. Um, right there and my journey to here is a bit circuitous but we'll go through it a little bit i was born in lagos i was born in, in nigeria we came from lagos to burlington vermont i did his phd university no I did his um, fellowship at the university of vermont phd at mcgill in um montreal postdoc work in philadelphia lived in a suburb called cheltenham my mom was did a pediatrics at Albany and Chicago. First job was in West Virginia. And then we all moved to Norman, Oklahoma at the age of 12. And I spent 18 years of my life there. And that's where I call home. Okay. We'll do that again. Nope. I went to Norman High School North, second graduating class, played basketball there, where another famous individual played basketball about 20 years later. I think you can see the arc of our careers have gone on. We chose the appropriate daytime professions. He is in the NBA and I am here. Um, I went on to Oklahoma University. I was a chemical engineer, undergrad, had a great formative time there. A lot of friends that I still hang out with and speak to to this day. And I went to OU College of Medicine. Uh, this is my sort of homeroom class, my pod. And it's been great to see us, you know, go through our careers. This doctor right here, his name is Mark Error. He is from Bountiful. He's actually an ENT across the street. I graduated from medical school May 31st, 2008. That is our graduation party, and that is an Operation Cake, and it was delicious. I stayed in Oklahoma for residency at the D. McGee Eye Institute. They do claim me. There is a wall of residence. I'm a picture is there, and if you can see, there's a there's a uh, shadow in the a reflection in the background. That's Dr. Aman Mittal. He's one of our former residents at UT Houston, who's actually on faculty at Dean McGee. Now he took, the picture, took that picture for me. Um, Ron Hobbs was my co-fellow here uh, in Retina. So we both came to Utah for our, our fellowship training, and he's now in back home in Arizona. But these are my co-residents, Dr. Adam Carver and Annie Chan there. During residency, I got hitched. I punched way above my weight. Still punching above my weight uh, this many years later. Took her to Oklahoma, took her to Utah, where she worked as an ICU nurse down in Provo and Intermountain. And while I was here, I got to be trained by these wonderful individuals. Taught me the art and science of neuroophthalmology, oculoplastics, and I could not do what I'm doing now without the foundation that was formed here. Okay, and that's what I looked like way back when. That smile on my face. Who are these cool cats on the screen? These were people that were training while I was here and are still here. Dr. Petty and Shakur and I were co-fellows 2012-2013. And you said Dr. Stagg and Dr. Huang and Dr. Zog, they were residents when I was a fellow here. So uh, again, really solid group of people get to train with, get to spend a formative time with, and again, a great experience. From here, I moved on to UT. My wife said, after spending a snowy winter here, take me home. Not Dallas, not Austin, not anywhere else, Houston. And I was very fortunate that they had a opportunity to be the director of neuroophthalmology at McGovern Medical School, UT Houston. It wasn't McGovern Medical School at that time. They came when the McGovern's gave $75 million a few years later, but this is the Memorial Medical Plaza. Our clinic is on the 18th floor of this building, and it faces this way. So that's going to be downtown is this way north. And then behind it is the Texas Medical Center, largest medical center in the world. Uh, we see patients at that building uh, to the right of it, which would be east of it. I don't know if you can see my mouse, maybe not. And that is the Memorial Medical Center uh, TMC. And... We also see patients at the hospital on your bottom right, which is Lyndon Baines Johnson County Hospital. A lot of indigent patients, a lot of 
indigent care. Houston has a really diverse population, um, one of the most diverse populations in the country. And we see patients with end stage third world disease all the time uh, when about a quarter of the population is born outside of the country. You see the gamut of everything. And it's been a wonderful formative experience for me, uh, even moving forward in my career and, and getting more experience. So I'm a neuro-ophthalmologist. Um, this is courtesy of Kevin Lai, my friend. Uh, people think I do what I actually do and what's really going on. Um, just a, in, a, in, a, in a snapshot here. Um, as you can see from my training, I do surgery. I'm a surgical neuro-ophthalmologist. I do orbital functional oculoplastics. I do adult strabismus surgery. And my interests are in diseases of the optic nerves and orbit, a bit of the publications that we've done over the past few years. And all of this is built, for the most part, out of my neuro-ophthalmology practice. So for those of you who are wanting to know how I can build a surgical practice being a neuro-ophthalmologist, that's how you do it, okay? Um, I also take adult trauma call for the oculoplastic surge service, where we do lots of different procedures. Um, taking out bullets from orbits there in the middle, really bad trauma up there on the right. Um, starting to do frontalis advancements for severe myogenic ptosis, take out tumors from orbits, reductive nurse fenestrations, over decompressions. These are all out of my neuro-ophthalmology clinic and it's the most fun I think I could have. It's really, really fantastic. So my academic start, obviously we wanna do a triumvirate of clinical care, teaching, and research. And I built the department basically from scratch because there wasn't anybody else doing neuro-ophthalmology there. And it was all fun. It was all good. And then in 2017, what really started me on the pathway, I think, to where I am today occurred. And that's because I became the medical student educator uh, for the department. And what that allowed me to do was to attend AUPO. And I went to AUPO in 2018. It was in Austin. Jeff was there. We met up. We commiserated. It was wonderful. And then I met two really important people, Mildred Olivier and Orice Knight. And I think Mildred was here not too long ago. Yeah. So I call Mildred the godmother of ophthalmology. Okay. She knows so many people and is so involved in ophthalmology at so many levels, but she is passionate about improving diversity and access in ophthalmology and making our field really special in that regard. And when I first met her, she kind of intimidated me because she's always asking me, hey, Edition, what are you doing for the cause? What are you doing for the cause? I'm like, nothing. And I really had to be, I really I kind of watched myself around her. I didn't, you know, minded my P's and Q's and I was trying to make sure that I was ready to talk to her when she came in, when she was around. Like, I'd like, I'd see her at a distance, like, okay, I'm not ready to talk to Mildred yet. Let me just go do something else. And then I'll talk to Mildred when I'm ready. But she, her example of just doggedly sticking after what she felt and knew was right was really inspiring to me. And then Orish is my brother uh, in the cause. And he is one of the co-directors of the National Medical Association's Pathway Success Program, uh, the Ravenable Excellence in Research Program. And he and I have done so much over the years. We've talked so much over the years. And he's also been another, another big inspiration to me. It was through these two individuals' influence on me that, that sort of sparked the fire, planted the seeds, so to speak. Uh, I wasn't doing anything in 2018 at that point, but that's one of the things that really started me on the pathway. And what really sort of began my journey in earnest was what happened in 2020 with the murder of George Floyd, the social justice movement, and the development of the Nanos DEI then task force, which is now a committee that I serve on as the vice chair and will take over as chair in July. And we've done a lot of work in revamping the Nanos mission statement, talking about what it means to be inclusive and how to improve diversity amongst our speakers, our committee members, and what it means to be an organization that values those things. So that was motivation for me there. And also, I have my own personal motivation. This is my legacy. These are my three kids. My oldest was conceived in Utah. He thinks of himself as a, as a Texan Utah to a, to a degree. Um, then my two other ones. Um, I want to leave a legacy. I want to leave an example that they can look up to and say, because he did it, 
I can do it. I saw my parents being doctors every day of my life as a kid, and it was never a question in my mind that I could be a doctor because I was literally from them. No question in my mind that I could do it. So I want them to see and, and, exam and, and experience the same thing. <laughs> so let's talk about the state of things and DEI lessons. First things, set to the stage, do some, some definitions. Um, talk about diversity being the presence of individuals that are different from each other. Okay, many different ways that can, that can be the case. Equity is providing the access to opportunities and resources each individual needs to succeed. Uh, not the same resources to everybody, which is what equality is. And inclusion means fostering value and empowerment that genuinely welcomes and accepts active participation. And you have all those three together in this Venn diagram. You have a state of what's called inclusive well-being. And all three factors are needed for well-being. Inclusion and equity without diversity produces what's called groupthink. Diversity and equity without inclusion produces forced assimilation. And diversity and inclusion without equity produces the glass ceiling effect. Like having dinner, Thanksgiving, and you have the adults table and the kitty table. Okay. You're all there. You're diverse, but you're not inclusive. Okay. The demographics of the U.S. is important for several reasons. Because right now, minorities make up about 30 to 40% of the population, depending on which numbers you look at. In the next 20 years, become the majority, okay? And we know that right now there are disparities in healthcare and access and equity for these populations. As they become more and more population, we need a workforce that can take care of them. We need as much as possible for our workforce to look like the demographic that we serve, that we live in. And as we'll go over here in a little bit, we're not really very close to that, okay? Within medicine, we have the term URIM, which is the preferred term to refer to individuals that are underrepresented in medicine relative to the general population, okay? And then historically marginalized groups, which is used to describe underserved patient populations. So the AMC at this point in time defines URIMs as these individuals, okay? And as demographics change, populations change, numbers change, these numbers could change in the future, but this is what URIMs are right now. These are the people that we don't have enough of in medicine, taking care of people, taking care of patients. Uh, what is the state of workforce diversity? And these next few slides are courtesy of my friend Fosco Reda at Johns Hopkins. She does a lot of work in this and we'll see her name pop up maybe a little bit later on this presentation as well. Uh, looking at trends in diversity of medical students uh, over the past 10 years or so, it's gone up and that's, that's, that's positive. Um, but it's still below the threshold that we need to accurately represent our populations. And when you see groups like American Indians or Native Hawaiians, they're almost non-existent. Um, they're not non-existent in our population, but they are in medicine. And we need to do better at helping them get into the field and providing care for uh, patients that look and talk like them. Um, from a uh, gender standpoint, sex standpoint, we're doing much better. Uh, women are half population, but they're greater than half of, of medical students, which is, which is wonderful. Now, I knew that ophthalmology was one of the least diverse specialties when it came to ophthalmology. I didn't know that among residency programs, we were the worst and not came out of paper from 2002. Dr. Imami was the senior author on this paper and actually interviewed her for the podcast to talk about uh, this project. And I, was, I, was, I wasn't aware that this was the case. And, and this was another sort of spark igniter in me that said, we have some work to do when it comes to improving diversity in ophthalmology. Uh, amongst uh, Residency, residencies, surgical, non-surgical, ophthalmology, again, trended up a little bit, and we'll see maybe why that's the case in a little bit, but still not anywhere near where we want to or should be. And there's ophthalmology. Uh, clinical departments were, again, near the bottom. And then in uh, overall applicants, residents, clinical faculty were uh, when it comes to sex diversity, we're below the the middle of the pack here. So it's getting better. I'm not going to paint a picture of gloom and doom for you, but 
there is work to be done. When it comes to fellowship applicants, uh, from a gender standpoint, uh, cornea and PD are doing pretty well, but glaucoma and retina need some work. And then for URIMs across the board, uh, we all need to do better, okay? So one of my passions is, is academic ophthalmology. Obviously, I'm an academician. We know that URIMs, especially African-Americans, are promoted at, few, at, at lower rates than non-URIMs, and they are retained in academics at lower rates than non-URIMs. And our absolute numbers overall are very small. And it's to the point where I actually can name to you all of the full professors of ophthalmology in the country that are black because I know them. Okay. I did that mental exercise in about 10 minutes. Looking at chairs, residency program directors, there are currently three African American chairs of ophthalmology in the US out of over 100 programs and three black PDs. And again, I know everybody on this slide. I never met Keisha Pickett, but I've heard of her. She's, she's doing a great job at WashU. We've got work to do. So why is this the case? Put a number of reasons up here on this, on this slide, and I won't read them off to you, but I want to talk about what may be, at least to me, is the 800-pound gorilla in the room, which is stereotypes and biases against URIMs, the perceived lack of qualification and ability. We live in a country, we live in a Western society that values certain things over others. And I'll tell you a personal story. I grew up in Norman, Oklahoma, son of physicians who live in an upper middle class neighborhood. And I rode the bus with all my friends to school, kind of knew who was there, rode my bike around the neighborhood. I knew, I knew who lived in the neighborhood pretty much. Hundreds of houses, hundreds of, of, of people. And I could only remember there being one other black family in our entire division. And I knew them because I mowed their lawn. I wasn't very good at it, but I think it was because I was black. They wanted me to, you know to mow the lawn for them. And she'll come back in the story again a little bit later. She's a friend of mine. Um, but then I moved to Houston. Houston is a much more diverse, much more ethnically egalitarian society, I would, I, would, I would say, because I live in the same type of neighborhood in Houston, upper middle class neighborhood, and it is the United Nations. I mean, all shades of the rainbow, all ethnicities, all countries. In my block, we have three or four African-American families, Hispanic families, Asian families, Indian families. Um, it's really spoiling to my kids because I think this is how the world is. But I remember first moving there and seeing people of color driving nice cars. And I was like, hmm, I wonder what they do to be able to drive that car. And I would never think of that of a white person. And I had to deprogram, deprogram myself of that thought process that is ingrained in the society and the culture. If I can have that thought process. How pervasive is it, right? So I'm working on deprogramming myself, but if I'm thinking like, why, what do they do to deserve or be able to, to earn that? What are other people thinking when they see URMs trying to matriculate up into areas or places that were historically, they were excluded from, right? URMs cannot thrive in environments where they're not welcomed or understood. Um, black residents tend to be dismissed at higher rates than non-black or URAM uh, residents. Um, that's in different fields of, of surgery and orthopedics. Um, and these are numbers that aren't like a margin of error, like a rounding error. Okay, you gotta think of why is this happening if everything should be equal, right? Some of the issues faced, implicit bias, microaggressions, stereotype threat, in the minority tax, the stereotype threat is really pervasive among URIMs. It's that thought that if I don't represent when I go to a place that people like me don't usually go to and I don't do a good job, I will paint my entire people group as negative and essentially slam the door shut behind me so the folks can't get into here. It's a big burden uh, a lot of us carry. And the minority tax being the cultural and ethnic representative, you know, you're black, go see that patient, or you're black, be on the DI committee, or do this or do that, because you can relate. And we can get some, in some nuanced discussions about who should be doing DEI work, who shouldn't be doing DEI work, but at the numbers we're at now, 
it's a lot for us to do. And the more allies we have doing the work, the better I think we'll be as a specialty of medicine and ophthalmology. There was a paper written a few years ago interviewing minority residents on the role in ethnicity in the training experiences. This was done at a conference in Atlanta. And 27 residents from 21 residency programs, um, all different specialties uh, in medicine. And they basically confirmed what we suspected, deal with microaggressions. Um, their tasks as race or ethnicity ambassadors to minority tax, uh, challenges negotiating a professional person identity while, see, while seen as others, right? Pressure to assimilate, code switching, speaking a certain way, acting a certain way, wearing your hair in a certain way so that you can fit in and not sort of rock the boat. Um, now, code switching can be sort of a personality thing. You know, the way I talk right here and right now is different from the way I talk with my friends back home. Um, I do change the way that I interact in certain different environments. For some people, it's really hard to do that. And when they try to be their authentic selves, it makes the job they have that much more difficult. So being accepting of our differences is important. The Pepper is resident at, at UCLA and I believe it was early last year, he just sort of realized, I am the only black resident in the entire county of Los Angeles. Like, how can I be the only black anything in a county of 10 million people? And he tweeted it out and it went viral. And from that viral tweet came this article that he wrote. And what he talks about in the article is, again, this fact that there's this perception of URIMs as not being capable. There's an inaccurate assumption of a, of a, of a meritocracy that doesn't exist, really, uh, as we stand in this country. Uh, again, you can't be authentic self, you got a code switch. In addition to being in a stressful situation, being a resident, you know, the analogy of drinking a water through a fire hydrant as a PGY2, PGY3, you have to deal with these microaggressions, this being other, this minority tax on top of it, and that can affect your performance, which may be the, the cause of increased dismissal from residency. On top of being a minority, already dealing with the things you dealt with, not even being in medicine, okay? He challenged ophthalmology to be more proactive as opposed to reactionary in addressing DEI for our patients in our community sakes. Representation matters. And I told you that I, I'm a physician um, and I never thought I couldn't be a physician because I saw my parents doing it every day, single day of, of my life. And uh, for the podcast, I interviewed Dr. Maurice Knight. I'm trying to make this mouse work. There we go. And he gave a really important quote during one of our conversations, and I hope this audio works so you can hear it. You know, at my institution, I didn't see anyone like me in the Department of Ophthalmology. And, you know, I was... I had some questions as to whether or not this career was for me. And then I came to the Rav Venable program or the NMA, sec the NMA ophthalmology section meeting and saw all of these people who look like me, who are retina specialists and glaucoma specialists and cornea specialists and, and you know, doing things internationally and working on policy. And I could see myself in my career. Hmm. So... That's representation right. matters it's just just you know by and and the same thing happened to me you know my my interest in ophthalmology didn't become like tangible in my mind until i saw uh dr herndon so in the first part of the quote he's talking about how students that go to the rabbi Venable program get inspired to become ophthalmologists and he talked about who inspired him to become an ophthalmologist leon herndon who was a glaucoma specialist president of ags at duke and this is Orish Knight. If you know Orish Knight, Orish Knight is an ophthalmologist's ophthalmologist. He was born to do it. And it didn't register to him that he could do it until he saw somebody else doing it. And that's why reputation matters. There are books written on DEI, the benefits of DEI, you know, improves organizational well-being, 
increases creativity and productivity, cultural sensitivity. Think about it. The more diverse backgrounds you have in a place, the better you have a milieu for developing ideas and problem solving. And because race and socioeconomic status are surrogates and cultural experiences uh, all come with your identity, bringing diversity into the workforce just fosters a better place to make things happen and get things done. Uh, we know that there are disparities in ophthalmic health care, higher instances of black uh, blindness uh, among minorities, higher prevalence of glaucoma in African Americans, diabetic retinopathy. Uh, in ophthalmology, black IH patients are more likely than non-black eye patients to have severe visual loss uh, in at least one eye. URIMs use low division devices at lesser rates compared to whites, and there are fewer numbers of minorities undergoing necessary surgeries for their disease processes than uh, majority groups. In ophthalmology itself, and I presented this last year, and then I'll present it again. This is a study that came out of Penn and looked at socioeconomic and geographic disparities in idiopathic intracranial hypertension. And it was a single center case control study of women diagnosed with IIH versus healthy controls in Philadelphia. Looked at geographic data and neighborhood data, income status, uh, in addition to race and ethnicity. And what they found was that the majority of patients were black or Hispanic in low neighborhood, low income neighborhoods, and 20% relied on, on Medicare. Um, and it tended to cluster in neighborhoods that were deemed to be uh, food swamps rather than food deserts. So we know what food deserts are. Food is the place where you can't get nutritious food. There's no grocery stores. There's no access to nutritious food. Okay. A food swamp has food. It's just not good food. Okay. It's the corner store, Chihohos and Ding Dongs. It's Popeyes and Jack in the Box. You can get food, but it's not food that's going to make you healthy. And it's food that can make you gain weight and become obese, which we know is a huge risk factor for IH. Why wouldn't you get high IH prevalence higher in these places where you? have these minority patients, okay? What I really want to focus on is what Dr. Tom Delaney said, and I love this quote, and I've been quoting it all over the place. He said that sometimes in medicine, there has been a tendency to assign too much biologic or genetic value to racial differences at the expense of understanding more deep-seated disparities in how patients interact with the healthcare system and the care they receive when they do so. Just because you have a doctor doesn't mean you have a therapeutic relationship with that doctor, okay? Race is a social construct. The idea of race being genetic has been debunked left, right, and center, okay? We need to look more at how socioeconomic status, allostatic load, meaning the stressors, environmental, social, or otherwise, how those affect our health, in our gene expression, because we know that over generations, these things add up. African-Americans express genes now because of the slavery and Jim Crow injustices that their ancestors faced, okay? African-Americans, I was, I was listening to a podcast, which I, I do, um, the Mayo podcast, and Dr. Coleman was talking about the fact that African-American African patients after having glaucoma surgery have to be on, on anti-inflammatories much longer than, than non-African-American patients. Why is that? Well, these patients live in an almost constantly stressed state. The cortisol levels are high. There's inflammation in the body all the time. So, of course, you need to treat the inflammation after surgery longer because they're just ramped up all the time. Okay? Um, I love this quote, and I'll, I'll, I'll use it for, for as long as I can. Cautionary tale, I'm gonna out myself as a bad patient, okay? About three years ago, two, three years ago, I started noticing this scintillating scotoma in my right medial upper vision and it looked like opt opt octopus legs kind of swimming in a sea of darkness. That's kind of weird. I have asophagic migraine, so I thought, oh, just, and I, I thought it was in both eyes. So I thought, oh, it's just it's a migraine aura. It comes, comes and goes. I'm not sure what it is, but I sat on it for a while. Then I finally called my, one of my neurology friends and said, I got this thing going on. I think it's a central neurologic issue. Can you get a scan for me? You ordered an MRI scan, got some inflammatory work done, all clean. Looked at the scan myself. The neurophthalmologist always do. My brain was clean. 
I said, okay, I'm good. So I, I forgot about it, but it was still there, just kind of floating up here. My vision. Like, if, if I do this, I can't see my fingers. Okay. Then last year, last April, I was like, man, this is not cool. I figured out what's going on. Um, I have flashing lights in my vision and a scotoma. I'm like, oh my gosh, it is an RD. So I was about to travel to New York to do a, to give a talk that weekend. And this was like a Monday or Tuesday. I had the technician in the clinic after clinic, take a picture of my eyes. And she was like, oh, that's not good. I was like, what are you talking about? If a technician is telling me it's not good in your eye, like that's really not good. So he sees this. Your residents, can you see that? So me, as an ophthalmologist, I don't know what this is. I just see a big bolus defect in my eye, and I'm like, oh, my God, I'm going to go blind. I saw my career flash before my eyes. I went home. I didn't move. I actually saw one of my um, – I called all of my retina docs, finally got hold of one of them, said, you got to see me tomorrow. So don't eat after midnight. I guess I have to do your ID repair. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I got to buckle and all this stuff. So I go there the next day, and as I'm seeing him, as I'm talking to him, he's walking it back. I don't think this is an RD. It looks like senile retina schesis which is not progressive. I think you'll be fine. And I sort of walked me back from the ledge. And I actually I already canceled my trip to New York. Like, I'm not coming. I was like, okay, I'm coming again. Yeah, I'm going to come and talk about what I'm going to talk about. But if I, as a well-educated ophthalmologist, waited this long to get this diagnosis made, imagine how many uneducated people out there who already have misgivings misconceptions and fear of the health system are dealing with things that they need to have taken care of. And in my case, this is benign. I'm not going to go blind from this, Lord willing. Okay. But there are folks out there dealing with real medical issues that are not seeking care because they don't trust the system. They don't want to come in and they don't have the resources to actually get that taken care of. Okay. And then here I am, you know, I never thought I'd be diagnosed with something with the word senile in it at this age, but you know, again, another discussion. It matters for patient care because our patients see themselves in us. Concordance of patient compliance, patient compliance, patient healthcare outcomes improves when there's concordance of social, ethnic, racial background between patients and doctors. And you would say, oh, it shouldn't be that way. If I just develop cultural competence, I can take care of patients. In an ideal world, that'd be great, but that's not the world we live in. Okay, patients want to see folks that look like them, and it, it makes a difference in their care. And that's not to say if you're not a URIM, you can't take your patients with better URIMs. You can. Um, but until we get the critical mass of doctors that can take care of these patients in a culturally sensitive way, we're going to have these disparities in, in health, health outcomes and health access. Okay, And we also tend to practice in places where our cultures live. Okay. So what's being done? Just some positive things to talk about here. The AAO is all over this. And as somebody from a minority background and knowing the history of race and society in, in the US, we tend to be skeptical when people profess to want to do things about diversity. But the academy has put its mouth, money where its mouth is, it's put its resources where its mouth is, and they're doing the good work with the mom group, mom program, task forces on diversity and disparities in eye care, adding social terms of health to the BCSC, um, the companion that came out in late 2022 of uh, disparities in eye care, and not just disparity, but what are we doing to improve um, healthcare and, and disparities in, in ophthalmology. The NMA and Rad Venable program um, are doing a lot of work to support URIMs in their training uh, coming up through med medical school, uh, into residency uh, with the Pillar program. This is at Stanford every year, kind of a heat retreat for URIMs. I think we'll see that there may be a couple of folks who are rec recognized on this screen that have maybe participated in that. Okay. The Pathway to Success program, giving, again, students the resources they need, um, application review. Uh, board review, uh, mock oral boards. Again, these are resources that everybody else has had at, in spades that these groups haven't had in the past. You might say, oh, you're giving them an unfair advantage. When you start a race 400 years behind somebody else, you need some help to, to catch up. 
okay? Is it working? We're seeing a blip in the radar, okay? I don't know if you can see these numbers, but um, over the past few years, the numbers of URIMs matching into ophthalmology has gone up. And where you didn't see Native Americans at all earlier in time, they're coming up into the, the numbers now. Now, is this a real trend or is this the surge coming out of the social justice movement? We'll have to see. It needs to be a sustained effort, right? Beware of DEI pitfalls. Okay, DI is a placebo. This is, I'm doing the right thing because it feels good, but not, my heart's not really in it. Okay. Setting people up for failure, bringing folks into institutions and places that weren't made for them, throwing out the red carpet without making sure that the, the room is ready, so to speak. Okay. People will fail if they don't have the appropriate resources set up for them when they get in there. Okay. Now, I said we need diversity, equity, and inclusion, but we don't necessarily do it in that order. Okay. Do some what we call DEI math. Diversity minus inclusion minus equity equals tokenism. Okay? You must first have inclusion and then equity and then bring in diversity to have well being. That's the order you do that in. Okay? Without inclusion, diversity remains unfilled potential. Now, I said there's this big surge of social justice movement that came out of 2020. And we are living in an era of what I call backlash. We had the SCOTUS decision, Students Fair Admissions versus Harvard in North Carolina, that basically sh uh, shut down affirmative action in um, state sponsored, sponsored, federally sponsored institutions. Uh, my state has an anti DEI bill. Your state has an anti DEI bill. Oklahoma has an anti DEI bill. I mean, I could directly get in trouble for saying DEI right now, okay, which is absurd to me. The association, the, the American Academy of Dermatology had a proposition to get rid of their DEI uh, programs, which thankfully failed. House of Diversity and Inclusion is disbanded as of this year. And the next thing I'll tell you is not to judge any one individual, but to just show you what's going on um, at a federal level and how it touches ophthalmology. There is the Educate Bill that comes out of Dr. Gregory Murphy, Murphy's office. He's, an, he's a, like a urologist in North Carolina. And the Educate Act would cut off federal funding to medical schools that force students with faculty to adopt specific beliefs, discriminate based on race or ethnicity, or diversity, equity, and inclusion offices, or any functional equivalent. You have DI office, you won't get federal money. And part of the argument is because this has become an ideology, so to speak, okay? So medicine is about serving others and doing the best job possible in every circumstance. We cannot afford to sacrifice the excellence and quality of medical education at the hands of prejudice and divisive ideology. We risk a generation of physicians ill-equipped to meet the needs of their patients. Do no harm, applauds Congressman Murphy taking this critical first step to end harmful DEI practices and make academic excellence the priority for medical schools once again. So somehow promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion will harm medical education and reduce the quality of care that patients receive or the quality of medical education. You might as well slap me in the face. So you're telling me that my presence in medicine and ophthalmology waters down the talent pool. I'll let that marinate for a little bit, okay? Yeah. I was, next what's coming out of my mouth. So they're trying to strive that what's happening and yet, and yet their excuses for what they're saying is so, is so inherently racist. Yeah. It's just a disconnect. It's just gobsmacked. There's no data to back this up. This is all ideological. And how it touches ophthalmology is Dr. Murphy received the Visionary Award from the AAO this year because of his other work that he was doing to advocate for scope of practice in medicine. Another co-author is Miller Meek, Dr. Miller Meeks from Iowa, who's another staunch supporter of ophthalmology. He's an ophthalmologist. I'm not disparaging the AAO. They didn't know about this when they awarded him the award. But it's good to know 
what your politicians believe before you vote for them. How do we combat this? Um, if you read the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, you know, you catch more flies with, with honey, right? Be nice to people and don't sort of stir up the, the, the boat or the pot. If you come at people with ideology, ideological beliefs, who are deeply entrenched in what they believe, they're going to fight back. Okay? They're not going to want to talk on any sort of rational level. So things that we can do, you know, diagnose specific inequalities in your organization, focus on changing systems rather than people. It's a systems issue. Emphasize that DEI efforts require and will benefit all groups. A rising tide lifts all boats. Lay out clear expectations for change along with the resources and support. And a firm effort at acknowledge accomplishments to sustain momentum when you do start getting uh, things moving in a positive direction. The Academy is, again, unwaveringly behind the MOM program, supporting DEI in ophthalmology. Um, and in a response to the Educate bill, the proposal, the AAO put up the statement on its website in uh, concordance with other academic medicine groups uh, to support DEI in ophthalmology. I'm running out of time. I'm going to go quickly. Uh, what I'm doing, what you guys are doing, I mean, this was an old screenshot from what the Moran was doing a few years ago. I know you can't put that on your website anymore, but thanks for doing it. Uh, you guys are on the forefront of, of the thought and the, the nuance and what needs to be done in, in ophthalmology. I do town halls. I do my podcast. You can support the mom program, support your specialty groups and societies. Did a podcast episode with Jeff uh, last year talking about residency issues. Really fun. You should listen to it. It was a great conversation. We're back to academic uh, ophthalmology, one of my passions. We know that URM is an underrepresented in ophthalmology um, at a significant level. And we have now developed what's called the Intrepid Program, which is a uh, pathway program to support and promote URM junior faculty into areas of leadership and help them advance their careers. This is the next step in the pathway. Mom, Rap Venable, Pillar, Intrepid. The call for applications came out um, two weeks ago, almost two weeks ago, and the uh, deadline is on Monday. So if you know anybody who might want to apply for this in academics, please get out the word. We start the program in August. I'm on the Denis D Den Denos DI uh, committee. Um, our goal is to make ourselves be ir irre irrelevant. We want it to be a part of all that we do to the point that we don't need a DEI committee anymore. Okay. Include social services health in your research. This is a multi citizen study I'm working on. You guys are working on this with me. I'll get you some data here in a little bit. I haven't forgotten about you. Okay. Things you can do. Okay. My podcast journey began because I live in Houston, but not really. I live way down there in Missouri City. Okay, I drive to work every day, about 30, 40 minutes. Instead of dealing with Texas road rage and not getting shot on the roads, um, talk to a friend of mine who says, he says, my friend, his name is, is Dozy Corbe. He's a VP, at, he's an executive at, at Chevron. He said, I listen to Audible podcasts. And when you go to work, instead of just dealing with the road rage, learn something, educate yourself, make yourself better. That's what I started doing. These are my podcasts I started listening to. Um, and in the spring and summer of 2022, um, I was nominated to participate in the leadership development program for AAO. And I saw a thread on the Black Eye Doctors WhatsApp group about stories about patients, about doctors who were told they couldn't become ophthalmologists. They shouldn't become ophthalmologists, shouldn't be doctors. And I want to tell these stories. And the project that came out of um, the my desire to work with the uh, leadership development program came out of my identity as an ophthalmologist, as a Black ophthalmologist, as a practicing neuro-ophthalmologist, as an academic ophthalmologist, as one of the 25 or so academic African-American neuro-ophthalmologists in the country. Okay, I'm a unicorn. Not a lot of us out there, okay? My podcasts are called Cypress Arise, which used to be my Twitter handle. I'm not on Twitter anymore, so don't look for me. And called Out of the Blind Spot for Neuro-Ophthalmology. Okay, these are all available, all these different media, like, subscribe, all that cool stuff, okay? And I spoke with Dr. Diggory about History Nanos earlier this year. Podcast is out. Great conversation. Okay. So equity-mindedness is important. Requires awareness of the social and historic context of exclusionary practices in America. Uh, calls attention to influences producing inequity and training trainees experiences. Uh, we have to train, recruit, and employ diverse group of trainees. And all this makes us better. A rising tide lifts all boats. And 
you know, as we finish and I wrap up, you know, DEI to me isn't just an abstract thought concept or some random program. Okay. Even though I wasn't necessarily poor, part of a formal DEI program, it's the concepts of DEI that were applied to me as I came up through medicine, through ophthalmology, through neuro-ophthalmology, here in these very walls that has given me the opportunity to have this platform, have the opportunity to see the patients that I see, do the work that I do. And not just that, but to be able to represent to my kids and other URIMs that not only could you be a, a doctor, an ophthalmologist, or a neuro-ophthalmologist, but you can live your dreams. This is my dream. I'm here at Moran giving the single alumni award. I, I, I couldn't even, I thought I'd talk to Jeff about this. This is not how I appreciate me coming back to, to Utah after graduating from, from residency. Um, but I want this for others. I want this for my kids. You know, we go to meetings, we go to society, organizations, and you just don't see people that look like you. I, I, I want to see that change. You know, I'm kind of tired of being uh, a unicorn. I'd rather be a horse. Maybe just maybe even a zebra. Okay. So the things that I've learned, DEI is important for our specialty. It's got to be intentional. It's got to be part of all that all that you are. Learn what you can, learn your biases, learn to address them when they come up. Um, I'm blessed to be an ophthalmologist and an ophthalmologist. Podcasting can be hard work, but it's fun. Thank you for having me. This has been the honor of my career. Um, I'll take questions if you have any. They just gave it to me anyway, even though I had my hand up, but I was, it was going to go up. So we're so proud of you and what you're doing and following on that carefully. And you're the perfect example of where we need people out there who, who are showing that skin color doesn't matter. Other things don't matter. Anybody can go out and excel and succeed. So helping people have the vision to be able to pursue and move forward with that. And then let me just talk about this, what you call you know, the, the pushback. Uh, as I talk to people who I consider are reasonable, there's certain flash words that have taken on a meaning which are totally separated from what they actually mean. Uh -huh. In fact, they don't even know what they mean. Yep. That was true with, uh, you know, critical race theory. Oh, I you know, people, I'm like, you know, you try to and you try to talk about it. And so I found if you just talk about, you know, here's the things that we've learned. Oh, yeah, I understand that. Well, yeah. that's actually kind of the basis of critical race theory. There's There's always stuff on both ends. So I think what's critical in, in this environment, and what I told the people here is, and, and uh, Dr. Werner is the one who's our you know, IDE director here, is look, <clears throat> we're gonna just do exactly the same thing because it, it's important, we have to do it. And uh, um, you know, you're, you're, we're, gonna, we're just gonna change your title just because it's become a lightning rod. And uh, um, you know, a uh, pr professional opportunity or or something or professional fairness and 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 people can get that yeah. but is that's what we're really talking about no, I, and but but it, it shouldn't change any of the important things that we're doing moving forward and i think that's critical uh, too many people are a little bit the sky's falling in we can't do anything and I've learned, no, 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 you, you can always move forward, particularly when you're doing the right thing, which is which is what we're talking about here. So I just point out, people, don't be too concerned about these things that happen often for stupid reasons, because there is the the very sense of what we, and, and we got fired up because of what happened to Floyd and, and that horrible thing about We've always been open about it, mm -hmm. but we've never been as aggressive as we know we need to be. So I just ask everybody here, continue doing it and 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 don't do worry because don't worry too much about what a title has become a lightning rod that has no bearing on the actual meaning, sadly. I, I couldn't agree more. And if I had a time, I'd, I'd have unpacked that a little bit during the talk. The idea of concepts being labeled as negative, DEI, CRT, Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter, duh, <laughs> right? Critical race theory, you say CRT to a certain group of people and they just heads explode. And but like you said, if you talk about 
the underlying concept, the underpinnings of what it espouses, they'll agree with you from here to high water. But you say CRT, right. they lose their minds. And the reason for that is because it's become ideological, not right. facts-based. Right. Okay. You talk to anybody with the NMA, the mom program, they'll spit numbers to you all day long about disparities in healthcare, what we're doing to change that. But I don't see numbers. I don't see facts in the backlash. I just see we don't like it for this reason. If you really want to take care of patients better and improve the quality of medicine, you improve diversity. That's where the facts lie. Mm -hmm not banning it and taking away money from things that are actually making us better. You're here. Just know how proud we are of you. Thank you. Thank you. First off, thank you so much for the talk. Uh, this is inspiring, but also incredibly informative. Um, I gave a, a, a talk on diversity about a month ago to medical students here at uh, the University of Utah. And I, I was actually uh, moved by a question I received uh, by one of the medical students. He was essentially asking, you know, whenever he was in residency, uh, what are the things that he can do to kind of address that key equation that you brought up with mm -hmm. inclusion being the first thing, you know, before you hit diversity. So from his standpoint, he was asking, uh, how does he mold an environment that's uh, more inclusive, you know, being just a resident, as he said, uh, how would you answer that question? Yeah. That's a good question. I think when we see a problem, we're so motivated, we want, we want it to change tomorrow. We want to flip a switch and it's, and it's done. It's a process, okay? And during residency, what I really want you to do as a URIM is to focus on excellence. Don't give anybody an excuse to use stereotype threat against you. That's number one, okay? Number two is have it in your mind as an important thing. You have your small sphere of influence that you have. Influence those around you, your friends, your residents, your co-residents. Know who the EDI, well, I guess we can't have DI now, but the person who in the medical school would be that person to talk to about, you know, having influence in, in different, uh, going out talking to the community, uh, talking to residents, okay, include social terms of health in your research, okay? When you ask clinical questions, ask how this affects different patient populations and how does access and, and associate with all these things. But don't try to change the world tomorrow. I know it sounds counterintuitive because we all want things to change really quickly. And don't be frustrated when you don't see the change that you wanna see immediately. It's an iterative process that takes time. But influence your local environment because these things spread. Um, but first and foremost, you focus on yourself on being excellent. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, great presentation, Arefe. Um, yeah, it was awesome just to hear your whole story and just hear your discussion on that. Um, so Arefe was the, the neuro-ophthalmology fellow when I was a resident, and that's like the most important person in the building when you're a resident, I think. And uh, it was just awesome to work with you and learn from you. Um, it's, it's still the most important person in the building when I'm attending to is knowing who the neuro-ophthalmology fellow is. But um, I really liked, I, I thought you were just so, you touched on so many things, but the words you used when you were talking about some of the backlash and addressing that, and I think you, you talked about, because that the backlash is like, frankly, disturbing. It's like like things that I, it's, it's super disturbing and super disappointing. Um, but I liked, you talked about like focusing on specifics mm -hmm. and problems and data and I think that that like that sounds like a way that could be really sustainable moving forward I was wondering if any like examples of that come to mind to you or, or places where you've like really addressed like something specific or thought thoughts along those lines yeah I think I think trying to have an ideological argument with somebody who is deeply entrenched in ideologies is not going to work um, I think you have to try to understand where they come from as much as possible. Um, doesn't mean to espouse their beliefs, but as you have conversations with people, and I don't know that I have a specific example, here's, here's an idea to have. When you see a flamethrower, somebody who's saying anti-DEI things, you're having a conversation with them, instead of firing back at them, just stop and listen. Listen, hear them all the way through, okay? And then 
because when you hear them actually talk, you can you in your mind you're picking apart their arguments just one by one by one. And you just ask very subtle questions, very open-ended questions about why do you believe that? Where's the data to support that? How does that help things move forward? And they themselves have to then answer you with some sort of factual retort. But if they don't have one, they'll just be sitting there looking at you. And it makes them go home and think, okay, this guy didn't attack me back. He just asked me what I believe. And I think that's a way to combat some of the vitriol we're experiencing, right? You catch more flies with honey. It's easy to get mad. I can get mad really easily telling me I don't add to medicine. Are you kidding me? And I could yell at him based on that, but I was like, oh, so you believe this, why? Where does that come from? And as they unpack what they believe, you can just start slicing it down. Just start slicing it down. Start slicing it down. Okay? Does that make, make that make sense? Two mad people will never find the Nope. Sure won't. All right. Thank you. Thank you.